which is called Qairawan. In this capital, they deliberated. And I want to stop a moment with you to remind you of the importance of Qairawan. This was the western capital of Islam. This is where the great Sahnun of the Maliki Madhab and the great ulama put together the Madhab of Imam Malik Rahimahullah. It was the spiritual educational capital of Islam on the western side. And so the events happening today in Tunis are of crucial importance to our future. This is the western capital of Islam. And we should all make a special dua for the people of Tunis that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring them to the good, bring them to righteousness, bring them to maslaha, that their society would leave the darkness of oppression and enter back into the freedom of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect the people of Tunisia. May Allah raise up amongst them leadership to take them from darkness into light. And may Allah make them examples for the rest of the Muslim world. When the Muslims entered into Spain and Portugal, they faced the Visigothic oppressive army. Allah blessed them with victory and they opened up the country. Everywhere they went, the people opened up their doors. Why did they do this? Why did Tariq ibn Ziyad and Musa bin Nusayr reach all the way to France? Within a short period of time, they were controlling the whole country because they did not force the people to change their religion. They lifted the taxes. They had a society, a tolerant society. And the people lived in this condition for 40 years in freedom after they had been living in oppression for hundreds of years. But there was something missing. They needed leadership. They needed to really understand the message of Islam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up a very important individual. His name was Abdurrahman ibn Muawiyah, Abdurrahman al-Dakhil, Rahimahullah, the falcon of Quraysh, the last of the great Umayyad leaders whose mother was Amazigh, she was a Berber from North Africa. He entered into Andalusia, was accepted as the leader, and he began to implement Islam. Remember, Dawah is Hatha Nas al al Khair wal Huda. Al bil Ma'ruf wa Nahi al Munka. This is the essence of Dawah. And so Abdurrahman Rahimahullah took over as Amir al Mu'mineen. He made his capital Cordoba. He immediately, one of his first action was to bring water into the city using aqueducts. By bringing water, he is raising the standard of living of the people. He went to the Christians and he purchased the cathedral of Cordoba for 100,000 gold dinars. He didn't conquer it or kill the people. He purchased it from them in a fair transaction. He then made it a center of education and learning. He stressed in his rule with the people equality. And as a ruler of Islam, he used to come down to the people, walk in the streets, attend the janazah prayers, feed the poor. He wasn't hidden in a palace or in a presidential office. He was living with the people in equality. And he stressed the need for education. And one of his first acts was to institute full education for all children. That all children, regardless of their religion, should learn to read, to write, to learn arithmetic. And if they wanted to learn the Quran and the Hadith, it was available to them. He then entered into a series of projects. He built gardens, opened public baths built a strong wall around the city to protect the people. He did a study of plants that are suitable to the environment of Al-Andalus, and they began to plant peaches and pomegranates and citrus fruits, and then they encouraged agriculture, until in places like Valencia, they were planting oranges, they planted rice and cotton, and palm trees. And so they encouraged the society. 
They encouraged people to be involved in trades. So they were providing employment for the people. And so they encouraged the trades, not only the normal trades, but they encouraged paper making, glass blowing, weaving, porcelain production. They raised the standard of level of the people and with all of that going on, he did not force the Christians or the Jews to change their faith. He allowed them to stay on their religion and it is reported that during the period of 700 years or so in Spain and Portugal, it was the golden age of Islam, but also it was the golden age of Jewish literature. Maimonides, Ibn Ma'mun, the great scholar of Judaism, lived under the Muslim rule. The Christians came for education, and it is through that education they were able to develop a renaissance. The renaissance of Europe did not come about in the 15th century with somebody sitting down and just opening up a Greek book or a Roman book. Isaac Newton sitting under a tree and the apple hit him in his head and he said this is gravity. No, Muslims already knew about gravity. So when the apple hit him in his head he probably turned to his Arabic book on gra his page on gravity and he found uh, the understanding and translated it into his language. So the reality was, it was a time of great organization. It was a time of great progress that the Muslims were under in that part of the world. And what is beautiful about it is that they did not compel other people to, to accept Islam. I cannot emphasize this more. Because the recent studies have found out that the majority of Muslims who lived in Spain and Portugal during this long period of time were not Arabs and Berbers or West Africans. They were European people. They were the indigenous people who had embraced Islam. Hundreds and thousands of the indigenous people had embraced Islam during that period. Why was it? Not because they were compelled but because Muslims showed them a superior way of living, an uncomplicated way, a way to raise your standard of life, to believe in God and still benefit from technology and from the society that you are living in. At one point in Al-Andalus, the Muslims began to lose their way. They began to drink wine. They began to fight between themselves. Tribalism came in, racism came in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up a group of people from North Africa known as al murabitun And they came into Al-Andalus and they revived Islam. They revived Islam in the region. Who are the murabitun And I am not speaking about present day movements. Who are the murabitun of the 11th century? What did they accomplish? Most people look at this group as a military group. The Moors conquered Spain. Al Cid. They went down into West Africa. Al Moravid conquered the kingdom of Ghana in the 11th century. But when you look at the Morabitun movement, you will find some amazing facts that has to do with the Dawah. It is reported that early in the 11th century, a man by the name of Yahya ibn Ibrahim al-Judali from the tribe of Judala. Remember North Africa, there was a big tribe called Sanhaja. The Sanhaja is Judala and Lamtuna. They are the people who take you across the desert. And this was very important in those days because it was the largest gold mine in the world. The largest active gold mine in the world was in the Niger River. They are the ones who take you across. And so Yahya ibn Ibrahim, Rahimahullah, he looked at his people. Some of them had embraced Islam. Other ones had not embraced Islam, but they were mired in adultery and fornication. They used to drink alcohol. And it is reported in the books of Ibn al-Kathir, 
Al-Bidayah wa Nihaya, it is reported that they would commit adultery, a man would commit adultery with his neighbor's wife, and the neighbor would say, well, that's fine, because I'm coming to your house soon. That's the level that they reach within their society. Stealing was the order of the day. A man could marry an unlimited amount of wives. Exploitation of the weak. Corruption in society. What did Yahya do? He said, I'm going to Mecca, but on my way back from Mecca, I'm going to stop in Qaydawan. Remember our city. Don't forget Qaydawan. I'm going to stop in the city of Qaydawan, and there I will ask for advice. So Yahya Rahimahullah, on his return from Hajj, he went to Qaydawan and he met the Sheikh of the Malakiyah, whose name was Sheikh Abu Imran Al-Fasi. He met him in Qaydawan. And Abu Imran said, I will send you a man who will take your people from darkness into light. And he dispatched a man by the name of Sheikh Abdullahi ibn Yasin Rahimahullah. Don't forget these names. Abdullahi ibn Yasin. He succeeded in going, mobilizing a group of people and going to the Jujala in Mauritania and southern Morocco. He went to them and he taught them righteousness. They rejected him and they wanted to kill him. And Yahya told him, go back to Qaydawan. He said no. And he went south. He went down to Senegal. He had five followers with him. And they set up a tent. And he began to teach. And it is from this place he taught his followers the Quran and the Sunnah. He taught them trades. He taught them independence. He taught them the importance of lifting taxes off people, calling to the good and forbidding evil. And after a short period of time, he had 1,000 followers around him. He continued to call to the good until Allah took his life in the field. When this happened, the Judala, the Lamtuna, they came back. And the leader of the Lamtuna at that time, Sheikh Abu Bakr ibn Umar al-Lamtuni, never forget this name. Sheikh Abu Bakr rahimahullah took over the leadership of the Murabitun. A dispute happened between Muslims. And so he took 3,000 Muslims south into Senegal in order to deal with a dispute between Muslims, to bring peace between two warring factions amongst the Muslims. When he reached southern Senegal, he realized there was a vast territory where people had not heard about Islam, who were mired in polytheism, who needed to have this understanding. And so he made his lieutenant, Yusuf ibn Tashfin, the leader of the Murabitun. He went south and continued to give dawah, going uh, eastward through the jungle areas, through the savanna regions, and continuing to go east. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, rahimahullah, took the banner of the Murabitun. He went back to the Judala and the Lamtuna. You know what he found amongst his people? He found that they had gone into a state of confusion. They needed encouragement to goodness. It's interesting when you go deep into history and benefit from what some of the du'at, the people in the field have gone through. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, rahimahullah, he found in the tribe of Rumara, there was a man by the name of Hayyin ibn Maniullah. He claimed he was a prophet. And he said, his followers only have to make two salats. He had a Quran in the Berber language. He said, you don't have to make wudu anymore. You don't have to make hajj. He said that eggs, bird eggs are haram. And female pig is halal. I don't know how he came to that. But he said female pigs are halal. He said if you have a fish, you have to slaughter the fish. The desert people in the Sahara, they don't see many fish. But he said, if you have a fish,